It's always a pleasure to be here at the conversation. It's a chance to meet different people and have long form conversations and, and learn about some really, really interesting people and aspects of life. Tim Samuels is no exception to that. He's the author of a book called Future Man and listen to who uh, Tim Samuels in. Uh, and by the way, this the, the book Future Man, how to evolve and thrive in the age of Trump mansplaining and me too, that's provocative enough. But Tim's an award-winning documentary filmmaker too. He's a broadcaster. He's an author. He's got uh, three royal. Uh, he's got three royal television society awards and best documentary at the World Television Festival. Tim, I don't have uh, the energy to make it through this entire uh, 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 intro, but I do want people to know that you uh, are a, a real force of of change, and you are someone who uh, has these shows on BBC One and BBC Two, and then on BBC Radio Four and BBC Radio Five, and and you have all these different media at your fingertips, and you make points in inventive and uh, innovative ways, and we'll get to some of them as we continue with this conversation. So with that lengthy introduction over, welcome Tim Samuels. Thank you, you must be exhausted after that. <laughs> it really did take a lot out of me, I was surprised. I'm sorry you had to go through all that biographical uh, detail. You could have just said, here's a bloke who's <laughs> in New York, who's come over from London, and that would have done fine. Well, you you do have the British accent, and you know how us uh, Yanks love the British accent. Uh, but I felt you deserved more than just the bloke uh, introduction, so there you have it. Uh, now, it, it's just you, a veneer of, of uh, credibility, which I'm not always sure we deserve. Well, you've you've done some things, and when I talk about, and I will get to the book, but when I talk about some of the things you've done in innovative ways, you uh, have done some things that might fall into the category of a stunt, but sometimes to communicate a message, you need a stunt. And, I, and I'm talking about uh, you are bringing to light uh, the plight of the elderly, and you yes. formed the world's oldest rock band called the Zimmers, and they became a thing, and you guys ended up on this kind of tour, you ended up on The Tonight Show. Tell us about that, first of all. So yeah, I wanted to make a documentary about how badly we treat old people. And rather than just reinforcing that sense of victimhood and showing how terrible everything is, all the lonely old people I met along the way who were stuck in tower blocks and on estates who didn't get out, who were at bingo halls that were shutting down, who were stuck in care homes that were just awful. I, I brought them together. I thought, let's do something which challenges preconceptions and what a be better way than forming a rock group with them. I mean, none of them had any musical background. So we brought them together, 40 of them, in the Beatles studio at Abbey Road and naturally covered the Who's My Generation with a, an 89-year-old singer, Alf, bless him, who sang, singing, I hope I die before I get old. And they kind of went ballistic. They went around the world, uh, covered by media from 50 countries, and then ended up going on the uh, the Jay Leno show alongside George Clooney that night. And most touchingly, they, they stayed friends afterwards and it had a kind of lasting impact on them. So, you know, for me, it's about taking really serious issues, but just with a bit of chutzpah and uh, left field thinking, trying to bring them to life and, and, and take people on a journey, not just reinforce where they start. No, that's exactly right. And, and the reason I really wanted to start with that story, and I'm so glad that we touched on that story, is that it, it did become a global sensation, but also because even if whatever projects, those of us who like to think of us uh, ourselves a bit as activists or whatever, don't reach global sensation status, it still reminds us that sometimes you need to sort of think in terms of innovative ways to get a message across. And you also did the same thing with, with uh, soldiers and PTSD, as I recall. That's right. Um, again, some years ago, we were neglecting our soldiers who's uh, fought, um, come back, and they had awful problems. You know, PTSD didn't have perhaps quite the same recognition it does now, though things are still pretty awful. So I, I formed a, a squadron of soldiers who uh, felt abandoned and we made a, 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 a statue molded on the face of an Iraq war veteran um, who'd been injured, had this giant statue and through a kind of a guerrilla action, drove into the center of Trafalgar Square in central London where Nelson's column is and put up our own statue next to that and had a, had a passing out parade and again, you know, great headlines, but the, the thing which really resonated was 
the emotion of seeing um, those men and women feel valued and feel that they were being listened to. Well, and it pointed up that art therapy and some of these other things that we don't think of traditionally as relating to PTSD are indeed very effective treatments or at least the, the beginning of a process of treatment. Yeah, I mean, it, I think any prime minister and president should spend time at a place called Combat Stress, which is a, a charity working with soldiers, veterans who are suffering the kind of mental aftershock of conflicts, conflicts that go back 20, 30 years. I mean, the human toll is kind of incredible. Um, and what was amazing there is you have these kind of big, tough guys um, who are struggling to perhaps express what's on their mind. But when they do art therapy, they, they start by drawing, maybe doing uh, some sort of painting or uh, building something. And then that unleashes the, the memories and allows them to then bring that to a therapy session and start talking about this. It kind of needs the art to unplug what's blocked, which they can then talk about and try and break down. I mean, I also I filmed at a, a VA hospital in Chicago, which was doing a similar thing with a, with a Vietnam vet um, who was making a kind of a mask, which he felt represented his emotions and what he'd been through. And it was it's 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 kind of amazing what art therapy can do. No, it's it's exactly right. And you know, uh, just on that point, it's amazing what the arts do generally. And so when we defund the arts in America, mm. you realize the downside even on young people uh, can be substantially more than just uh, whatever you think of as arts and crafts be, uh, being. It's a, it's not just a superficial connection that we as humans feel with that. No, I mean it, it's I guess it's the it's the easy piece of the budget to cut when you've got to fund, well, I was gonna say fund the health service, but you don't you don't really do that so much. Um, no, we do not. No, uh, or, or infrastructure, having spent the last week uh, on, on New York subways, I guess they're, uh, no. they're slightly underfunded. Um, but it's easy it's easy to, to relegate art, but um, there's a kind of intangible necessity to society without sounding too pompous. It's just that, the book is, uh, Future Man, How to Evolve and Thrive in the Age of Trump, Mansplaining, and Me Too. So let's get to that, Tim. Uh, there is a, uh, and I know you have this sense of humor, we've already seen it and you see it in some of the things that you've done in the past. Uh, but this is both uh, remarkable what's happening now with uh, this patriarchy that's been you know, so in place for so long, men just dominant in all these different ways and across all these different uh, subcultures within the main culture. Uh, and it is almost laughable at times, but there's also some serious stuff. How does it all come together uh, in, in your book? I mean, the, that, that's the kind of, uh, the starting point really is that people look at male dominance, business, politics, and say, well, what's the problem with men? And for the guys who are, you know, at the, at the top, there generally isn't that much of a problem. They're doing really well, and they've had a nice big tax cut recently as well, just to kind of make, make things even nicer. But it's such a sort of short-sighted thing to lump men together as this kind of homogenous block and say, well, just because the guys at the top are doing well, so is everyone else, and they're not. Because in this economy where you're living paycheck to paycheck, where jobs for life have gone, where unions have lost their power, where automization is kicking in, it's a really difficult time and, and, and economy, and so much of male self-identity and self-worth is tied up, for better or worse, with the work that you do. And given that insecurity, I think you're seeing kind of one of two things happening. The frustration and the anger and men not feeling like men gets channeled inwards into self-destructive behavior, whether it's opioids, drug abuse, uh, men drinking a lot more, um, or uh, mental illness and depression. Um, male suicide rates are three and a half times that of women uh, in the US or it gets channeled outwards into this kind of anger. And it's it's so easy to direct that anger at others, whether it's women uh, or immigrants or refugees. And that is such a powerful fuel for populism 
to feed off. So it feels that men who aren't taken seriously, who are on their economic downers, are the fuel that's driving this kind of resurgent populism in the US, uh, Brexit in the UK, uh, some of the far right parties that are um, part of the mainstream are on continental Europe. Uh, Brazil, you know, and there's a kind of hyper machismo leader um, who, who capitalizes on this. So, um, yeah, on the one hand, it's a bit counterintuitive for men to be sat here whinging. Um, but uh, on the other hand, if we don't take this stuff seriously, we're storing up some really deep rooted political and social problems, which is no good for anyone. It's a really interesting take, the notion that the populism and the rise of populism is linked to the chauvinism or the general view or fear or anxiety wrapped up in the patriarchy crumbling. I, I think it's the, the patriarchy uh, to some extent and the economy. I think the economy is huge. I think if you're happy at work as a, as a man, you're generally pretty happy. You know, it, it, it's... You know, in the in the last recession, um, there was an additional ten thousand suicides associated with the economic crash. You know, it is you, you see the cause and effect very very clearly with men. You know, and I know myself. You know, when I freelance and work collapses or things uh, don't go well, my serotonin plummets. You know, it, it's it's really simple. But when I'm busy and working and and productive, I feel pretty robust. So, I, I think. There was the cultural stuff and you know the shifting positions as well, but so much of it uh, is is economic and inequality and the growing sense of uh, have and have nots. And I think to really understand this, Mark, you've got to kind of look at the power of loss um, as an emotion. And loss is twice as powerful as any pleasure that you get. It's the thing that keeps you awake at night. When you go to the casino and you see a gambler who's trying to get back what they've lost, they're not rational at that point. They're desperate and they feel sick in the pit of their stomach. And a lot of guys who are struggling have lost their jobs, they've lost their identity, they've lost their security, they may well have lost their relationships, they've lost the chance of doing better than their fathers, they have a sense of entitlement that's lost as well. There's some really serious losses that are building up there and that breeds the desperation of a gambler. And at that point, you think, well, why not gamble on a radical political option? The status quo isn't serving me. I've been sat at this roulette table. My number's not coming in. I'm going to tip the table over and try something new. I might not like everything the populist leader says. I might have to hold my nose or look away around some of the racism or misogyny. But I'm so desperate, I'm willing to bet on something radical. That, I mean, that really does succinctly make the point, and you're right, it, it, economics first. Uh, you wrote a book called Who Stole My Spear? Mm. And the reason I mention it is you bring something of a perspective of someone who does understand sort of the male experience because you've, you've already done one book on that. And then uh, sort of so to, to broaden your perspective, it is, I would think, easier. Uh, tell me about that, because you make some assertions in that book that are that are associated with masculinity and the male image of himself. Yeah, so I mean, to uh, to kind of let the secret out, uh, who stole my spear essentially has morphed into, because I wrote that three years ago, um, Future Man um, is essentially an updated post-Trump, post-Me Too, uh, reworking of that book. So it's taking the same themes, um, but presenting it, I guess, really to, to the US audience, because having written about the potential for populism, I kind of finished the book and lo and behold, um, you had a fairly seismic election and we had a fairly seismic referendum. Um, so it felt like it needed to kind of, the, the thesis needed updating. Um, and Me Too hit as well. So just in the space of three years, there's been this kind of extraordinary change to, to men, to masculinity, to what they're facing, whether it's around how you conduct yourself at work or dating or 
people uh, with power being held to account, and then having this hyper machismo president uh, in place. So it, it, it just sort of felt like there was a lot which needed a, a addressing, um, given that we've had a fairly turbulent couple of years. <laughs> was, was Brexit, did Brexit fall into the same category uh, as the rise of populism that we saw in the US that you referred to? With the demographics are, are, yeah. are remarkably similar. You know, more men voted for Brexit, but you know, one of the biggest indicators uh, was educational level, and it's the same sort of uh, it's the same sort of demographic. You know, the the liberal metropolitan elites um, voted to to stay in Europe. It's the depressed economic areas who essentially said um, they put two fingers up to the system. You know, it, it may well be that they're the ones that suffer most when some of the uh, car plants close down or the economy potentially goes belly up. But it, you know, it felt like um, a sort of protest vote from, from the disenfranchised, from those who weren't listened to. Um, we also had you know, the best part of a, a million Eastern European immigrants come in a very short space of time into Britain, which on the one hand, the economy needed uh, arguably, but on the other hand, the concentration uh, of immigrants in particular areas naturally was very unsettling for people living there. And politicians didn't take that seriously at the time. They didn't soften the the pace of change for, for the people living in these areas. So th there was a kind of resentment towards immigration as well in a sense of Britain having an open door, which, which really fed into this. Yeah, I mean, it feels frankly like a kissing cousin of a lot of the stuff that we deal with uh, here and have been dealing with. And certainly, uh, as you say, uh, in the various factions that have been represented in this country very strongly, uh, a lot of the same uh, strands run through. Uh, I, I saw and smiled that you went on to promote your book with uh, Anthony Scaramucci. Mm. And what happened there? <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I guess I, I have a, a policy of, um, I think it's good to talk to people whose politics you might not necessarily agree with. You know, I'm, I'm of the view that it's better to have dialogue than sit in your own echo chamber shouting at the same people. Um, so yeah, I went on his-, his I'm his certainly podcast. not faulting you for going on. I wanna be clear, especially if you're promoting a book, so don't worry about that. Uh, but I heard that something weird happened where with the uh, size of testicles came up, because you do, uh, don't you make a point in your book about uh, uh, tendencies toward promiscuity and that sort of thing? And they, well, You go ahead, you, you explain it. Uh, yeah, so yes, I was obviously being very defensive about this, which says a lot about <laughs> I'll it up in therapy next week. But the- uh, the point I was discussing with with uh, the Mooch and his missus, as the podcast is called, <laughs> who are a hilarious couple, I have to say, very entertaining, um, was around whether, as male humans, we're actually physi physiologically designed to be monogamous. And I was saying, compared to other apes, which you know, part of the family, uh, the size of testes is indicative of, of monogamy or not, and chimps have giant uh, testicles to um, furnish their incredibly promiscuous lifestyle, whereas gibbons uh, have very small testicles um, and are monogamous. They don't biologically don't need to generate an awful lot down there. And as humans, we kind of fall between the two. So um, we're actually meant to be mildly polygynous uh, based on our physiology, which is kind of alpha male plus several women, which isn't an ideal way of, um, to kind of really run society uh, and have peace and harmony and, and uh, gender equality. Uh, but before I kind of got to that point, the Mooch uh, declared that he had um, generously sized um, testes. Um, but oh, by wow. the time, I think he said grapefruit, grapefruit, but by the time I'd got to the point um, that that was associated with promiscuity, uh, he, looked <laughs> slightly, he looked slightly taken aback, looked over to his missus and said, actually, they're the size of peas. Uh, so he, he buzzed in a little too early on the uh, on the testicle he, question is what you're telling me. He went straight to boast and, and had to backpedal because <laughs> it, he was implying that he, was, uh, he had chimp-like promis uh, promiscuous tendencies. <laughs> wow, I'd never really heard the uh, Gibbons chimp 
testicle size break down as a reflection of promiscuity and the need to fertilize the flock, right? That was it. But that is that based on uh, that's some kind of research? <laughs> yes, I mean, it was uh, fortunately it wasn't research I did myself. Yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, uh, primatologists, um, I mean, essentially the body is quite efficient and it generally doesn't um, you, you have organs larger than you need them. Um, and so through, through evolution, chimps, because they're all at it all the time, you need to generate as much semen as you can to literally flush out the, uh, the chap that's been in just before you. I, Whereas I, given, I, if he's, Wow, he's I never smart. considered it just that way. Yeah, this is a first on this show, by the way, for us to spend this much time on testicle size. But I hope not the last time we do it. Uh, and I feel like we've seamlessly transitioned from Trump to testicles, and um, good point. There's, no, there's a good gear shift there. Uh, quickly before we lose you, uh, you have a podcast as well on BBC. I think it's called All Hail Kale, right? Yes. Yeah, it's um, it stems from my inability to walk past the Whole Foods without going in <laughs> and uh, ca causing uh, near bankruptcy. Um, so I, I'm a sort of sucker for any wellness fad that comes along, but sort of reached the point where I wanted to know really, was it worth it? Um, is it worth spending that money? So I, it's, a, it's a look at wellness fads, but with some sort of actual expertise in journalism. So kind of imagine Gwyneth Paltrow and then don't. And you kind of... Um, <laughs> All right, Tim Samuels. Well, again, uh, the book is Future Man, How to Evolve and Thrive in the Age of Trump, Mansplaining, and Hashtag Me Too. And uh, it's another way you can reach Tim Samuels is at Tim Samuels on Twitter and the website you saw up there as well. But there's so many places and ways to get the book Future Man, and I hope a lot of people go out and do just that. Uh, Tim, entertaining, such a smart guy. Uh, congratulations on uh, everything you've done, and I hope that uh, we talk again soon. It's been a pleasure, Mark. Thanks.